Good afternoon. I'm George Latimer, Westchester County Executive. It's Tuesday, January 4th, and this is our weekly update of Westchester County issues. We uh, welcome you being here. Yesterday we were here for a formal inauguration for a second term, and now we're back to the normal updates, which usually happen on Mondays at 2 o'clock, and we'll continue on those Mondays that are not federal holidays. We do have a holiday coming up in a couple of weeks that uh, honors the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, so we will do our update that week on a Tuesday, but we'll stick to the Monday 2 o'clock update. Today's um, program has three basic bits of news. Good news, bad news, and good news. So stay tuned for the good news that follows the bad news. We are going to give you a full update on COVID. That is the bad news. The, the numbers are not good, but we will be straightforward and tell you exactly what we know to be true and uh, try to assess uh, what's happening. The good news that we have is uh, to introduce to you, at least in this format, the new leadership of the Westchester County Board of Legislators. For those of you who may not know, Westchester government has two distinct branches of authority. The executive branch, which is most of the operating departments. There are a couple that operate outside of the direction of the county executive and our executive floor. Uh, and that would be the district attorney, the county clerk, Board of Elections, and the legislative branch of government, which is the Westchester County Board of Legislators. That board was created in 1969 in its current configuration. 17 members of the Board of Legislators, each representing an equal-sized population district. Uh, and at the time, the last time this was done 10 years ago, uh, approximately 55,000 people represented by each legislator. And that legislature meets for a two-year term and uh, they select their leadership uh, for each two-year cycle. And we have a new chair of the Board of Legislators that we're going to introduce in a second. She's only the second female to ever chair the board, Catherine Borgia, uh, who is, uh, represents a district that includes Ossining, Croton on Hudson, portions of Court, the town of Cortland. And then we're going to introduce to you as well the new vice chair of the Board of Legislators, Nancy Barr, who represents Rye Brook, Port Chester, uh, an area of Harrison. And uh, these are very important jobs. They are a co-equal branch of government. Many things that have to be accomplished can be done only by the legislature and the executive branch working together. And there is some authority that is granted only only to the legislative branch. And if it seems like I know a little bit about this, I spent 13 years as a member of the Board of Legislators, and I had the privilege of being the chairman of the board for four years, uh, but that's a long, long time ago. Uh, Ken Jenkins also had a privilege of serving as a member, I think 11 years on the Board of Legislators, and he too served for four years as chairman of the board. But each chair and each board has different challenges that face them. And of course, uh, this is the first term that begins right with the COVID outbreak pandemic. And so it changes the dynamics uh, very greatly from what I what happened when I first became chairman 24 years ago and a little bit more recently for Ken. So we're very happy to have with us here uh, both of the two new leaders of the board. We're going to invite them up since we're trying to show COVID protocol. Uh, they'll be unmasked with at the microphone. I'll put on my mask and step away from the podium. Uh, but we'd like each of them to talk a little bit. This is their first full day on the job. They have been uh, seasoned legislators previously, and they've had other responsibilities. Catherine Borgia recently chaired the uh, Board of, uh, of um, Budget and Appropriations, which is most likely the most important uh, uh, role that the board can play in the committee structure, and she's a past majority leader, so she really knows her way around the place. And uh, we're very much looking forward to working with her as the new chair of the Board of Legislators. So I introduce to you uh, the chair of the Board of Legislators, the Honorable Catherine Borgia. Catherine, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it is an honor to be here to be invited to join in the weekly briefing. Um, we know that working together with the ninth floor, we can accomplish great things for the people of Westchester. We're very excited to start this new term, even though we face a lot of challenges. We know that the resources and the talent here in the county and uh, among the people of the county, we know that we will be successful. So we are here to serve you. We always like to say, and when George and Ken were um, chairs of the Board of Legislatures, that the the legislature is the people's house. Please come to us with your concerns and questions and we will help you. Thank you. Thank you. 
And I should point out that I, I referenced that Catherine uh, had prior experience on the Board of Legislators as the Majority Leader, as Chair of the Committee on Budget and Appropriations, but she has a much more extensive public background as well as her private sector background. She was an elected member of the Ossining Village Board as a Village Board Trustee. She was Supervisor of the Town of Ossining. That's an executive responsibility on the Ossining Town Board, and the village is a part of the overall town. Town also includes part of the village of Briarcliff Manor. And she was also uh, working uh, at the state level of government as, uh, as an aide to Assemblywoman Sandy Galef. So she has village, town, and state direct government experience, which uh, helps her uh, in her new responsibilities leading the legislative body. So Catherine, good luck. We look forward to working together. I'm sure we'll have our moments, but uh, we always seem to come through them uh, as, as we've had. Um, now, the vice chair of the board uh, is, is a good friend of mine. She lives in the same area of the county that I do. She's a resident of the village of Rye Brook. She has served on the Rye Brook, or I should say the Blind Brook Board of Education, which is most of the village of Rye Brook's local school district. She's been president of that board. Uh, she is a lawyer by profession. She's got a little ivy in the background, which makes us all ivy envious if you don't have any ivy in your academic credentials. Uh, and she was just elected to her third term uh, representing, as I think I mentioned before, the village of Rybrook, the village of Portchester, and uh, the largest portion, although not all of, the town village of Harrison. So Nancy Barr, Nancy, please come up and uh, say hello, and it's congratulations, very happy to have you here. Thank you so much, uh, County Executive Latimer, and uh, I just want to say uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm so honored to have been selected as the vice chair of the board, and I'm looking forward to working with uh, Chairwoman Borgia. I've learned a lot from her in the last four years, and I'm looking forward to learning a lot more in the coming two years. And as she said, uh, we are here to serve you, and this is a board that really cares about the people we represent. and. Uh, you can call on us anytime, as my constituents know. So uh, looking forward to working with, as Catherine said, the ninth floor, which is the executive branch, and my colleagues on the eighth, eighth floor, which is the legislative branch, over the next two years. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, uh, Nancy Barr, Vice Chair of the Board of Legislators. I should point out that Christopher Johnson, uh, from the city of Yonkers has been named majority leader. He will lead the majority caucus, which is the Democrats who serve on the Board of Legislators, of which there are 15. And Margaret Kunzio, who's a registered conservative, runs with the conservative and Republican lines, is the minority leader for her second term uh, on the board. Uh, she's a resident of Mount Pleasant, represents a district that includes North Castle, uh, Mount Pleasant, and the hamlets of Mount Pleasant. And um, we look forward to working with them. I have served as a minority leader of the board. In fact, I'm the last member of my party to have been the minority leader, so I have a certain simpatico across the aisle. And uh, uh, we have also uh, identified, I believe, that Jose Alvarado, legislator from Yonkers, is the majority whip who aids the majority leader. And uh, Jim Nolan uh, from Yonkers is the minority whip who aids the minority leader. Uh, we have a structure which Catherine will no doubt highlight as uh, they do their board meetings. Uh, they'll be live streamed. You'll be able to see the board meetings. Uh, they have the ability under state law to operate remotely during this pandemic. And uh, however, uh, as chair, she determines to use that, uh, that uh, tool, uh, it, the, the work of the board will still go on. The various committees, I suspect, very shortly, you'll follow her making a public announcement of the chairs that she appoints to the various committees. And you should pay attention to that because each of those chairs, members of the board, have particular authority and power within those areas of public policy. And you can reach any county legislator by calling 914-995-2800. That's the general number for the Board of Legislators. And then each legislator has their own uh, direct line. There's a, there's a website that you can reach the Board of Legislators on. You can access it through the Westchester Gov website, or you can access it directly into the Board of Legislators. And, and the board puts out uh, a number of newsletters, each member, uh, puts out a number of newsletters and communications, and uh, if you if you contact the board, you know what district you live in, who your legislator is. If for some reason you're not on that list, you don't see those newsletters, uh, they come electronically, and uh, that saves paper and saves the environment. Uh, so you can do that. You can get information about what's uh, broadcast by the Board of Legislators online. So in the comfort of your own home, you can follow what the county legislature is doing. Uh, every year, the board uh, receives from the executive branch a 
capital budget in mid-October and then an operating budget in mid-November, and that is probably the most intense time of the year for the Board of Legislators as they deal with the fiscal issues. But all year long, they exert uh, financial oversight of the executive branch. But uh, that, that, is the, that is the check and balance of power. When I was on the other side of that equation, uh, we wanted the check and balance. And we're happy to have that check and balance today. That is what democracy is. It's all the different voices being heard on both sides of the aisle, between both branches of government. And I think in Westchester, we've respected that uh, and done very well for ourselves by having that balance. But all year long, the Board of Legislators meets on a set calendar. Uh, they, they will deal with a number of different issues, legislation, legislation which they create, legislation which sometimes the executive branch suggests. There are appointments to a variety of offices that require board approval. Uh, there are appointments to boards and commissions which uh, require the board's approval. The Board of Legislators has control over a number of different appointments and entities. The Board of Health members, the Rent Guideline Board members are completely at the uh, discretion of the Board of Legislators, not the executive branch. I have authority on, on most other boards and commissions, but not all of them. So the Board of Legislators wields quite a bit of power, and it's important to understand uh, as I just close out this part of it, what I consider good news. This is small d democracy at work. This is government. You go to the ballot box. You make the decision this last November 2nd who you want to put in public office. You don't put us in public office forever. There's term limits in my office, two four-year terms, eight years. There's also term limits on the county legislators, six two-year terms for a maximum of 12 years. And whenever a person enters the, uh, these jobs, there's a certain time clock that will expire, and then there'll be other people coming in, uh, and that, that is what the small de democratic process is. Most other levels of government don't work quite this way, but the county board of legislators, the county executive branch of Westchester government does. And I will also highlight that uh, we're looking forward, the executive and legislature branch informally, to have a series of coffees and conversations, uh, which we had going on pre-COVID, uh, for the first couple of years of my tenure as a county executive. It's something I did when I was a legislator with other levels of legislatures, when I was an assemblyman with the county legislature and so forth, uh, and now as a county executive. Uh, we tried to do a couple of them in December. Uh, a little tough to get people to come out, and with the COVID circumstances, we'll postpone doing that. But at some point in time, uh, Nancy and I will be in Port Chester and Rybrook, and Catherine and I have done that already in Austin, and we'll be back to do that. And it's an informal way to ask questions about public policy with your legislature legislator who generally knows more about the backyard issues in your district and your county executive who has certain authority that when married together with the legislature we can accomplish good things. So again congratulations Madam Chair, Madam Vice Chair, please extend to your colleagues our congratulations and our best wishes and we look forward to working with you in the two years ahead. Thank you very much. So with that, that's the good news up front. Now, I, I indicated there's some bad news. I'm joined now by our Deputy County Executive, Ken Jenkins. Uh, we are both recovering legislators, and we managed to become executives just in time for the COVID pandemic, which uh, has given us you know, quite a bit of concern. So you followed uh, in real time what has happened, and we've tried to give you these weekly updates. Uh, the numbers have been, frankly, horrific over the last number of days. We have followed since about the 1st of December the presence of the Omicron variant, uh, that has made its uh, presence known uh, across the world. And uh, just as the Delta variant, when it hit us uh, late June and early July, it was predicted maybe a week or two that there was a new variant out. It would have uh, a certain amount of impact, and it has lived up to its advanced billing. The Omicron variant, as we are told, we are not scientists, uh, was going to be more communicable than the prior versions of COVID. Um, uh, we didn't know if it would or wouldn't be more severe, uh, but we knew that in, in its uh, communicability, the fact that more people would get it in absolute numbers, even if the severity would be less, we would still have more people by numbers who would be compromised in their health, and these things have turned out to be the case. As you know, you followed this publicly, both Ken and I uh, contracted COVID about three weeks ago, roughly, and we went through our uh, appropriate protocols and uh, came out of it. Uh, we, we've each said publicly that we've had a very mild case of it. Uh, I've been double vaxxed, Ken double vaxxed and, and uh, boosted. And uh, we both had very light uh, impacts to us. I had functionally no symptoms at all, no fever, uh, no uh, respiratory problems, um, you know, asymptomatic until I was told I had it. But 
<clears throat> uh, that's not the case with everybody. So the numbers that we have today show a huge number of people that we know of that have been tracked that have COVID, and there are people beyond these numbers that also may have the disease. As of Monday, the information that we get from the New York State Tracker, we have pandemic to date, 192,288 people that have contracted COVID at some point in time, tested positive at some point in time during the totality of the pandemic. We have the number of active cases, the number of people who have an active case that have not yet gone through the 10-day period to fight off the disease with their, uh, their natural antibodies. We have the highest number of active cases today than we have ever had in the history of this pandemic by more than twice as much of the prior peak. 27,692 Westchester residents have an active case of COVID as of the numbers that we have through yesterday. To put that into perspective, the prior peaks that we had, one came in about April of 2020 within the first month of the pandemic. Another one came in January of 2021 two weeks after the uh, sort of the end of the holidays, the New Year holiday, and we reached 11,500 active cases. We have 27,692 active cases. And to put that into some idea of what's happened, we have had over the last few days, 2,200 new cases. The day before that, we had 3,300 new cases. The day before that, we had 4,000 new cases. The day before that, now we're on the last day of the year, 1231, we had 3,600 new cases. The day before that, 3,400 new cases. These, each individual day is, is more than we had active cases in the aggregate a month ago. If you go back one month ago, to December 1st. The numbers we have are December or January 3rd. So I'll go back to December 3rd. On December 3rd, we had 2,724 active cases. That compares to, on January 3rd, 27,692 cases. That is a tenfold increase in the amount of infections. And as a percentage, we were running an average of 2 to 3% infection rate in the beginning of December, we are now running an infection rate over 20%, approaching 25%, meaning of every test that is given out a month ago, two out of 100 tested positive, 98 tested negative. Now, 22, 23, 24 out of 100 are testing positive. Now, the testing data that we have is what's reported to New York State. Those are the tests that you have under certain conditions that are reported through labs, uh, maybe done at a hospital, maybe done at a medical group, might be done at one of the urgent care centers, done at one of our satellite locations at the county center elsewhere. There are many people who have home testing and have tested positive. That doesn't get reported into these numbers. And then over and above the people that have tested positive through home tests, there are people who have the disease, are asymptomatic, had no reason to be tested for it, and have COVID, and could very well be communicating it to other people. So the infection nature of the Omicron variant means that if it's 27,600 that we know about through the New York State tracking system, we could easily have another five, 10, we don't know the number, a thousand additional people that have this. And I know that there's always this certain uh, sense, going back to when this thing originally broke out, that now it is widespread and therefore uh, the milder cases, it's not that serious. And, you know, Ken and I both went through it. We did not uh, wind up in the hospital. We did not wind up on a ventilator. And we know a lot of other people that got it, similar level of severity. We're vaccinated. That does not mean when you have a tenfold increase in infection that you have no increase in the hospi hospitalizations and in the fatalities. Here was where the numbers are even more problematic. Let's go back to that date that I shared with you, December 3rd, one month ago, compared to January 3rd yesterday. January 3rd yesterday, the most recent number we have, is 444 people who are hospitalized for COVID, 444 as of yesterday. We had on uh, December 3rd, 84. So we've gone from 84 to 444 in the space of a month, people who are hospitalized because of COVID. Now, the degree of hospitalization, and people always ask me, the minute I give you some statistics, how many are in the ICU? Uh, how many, how many, how many? We have data that's given to us by the state of New York. We don't create the data ourselves. We report data the way it's been given. 
I think we saw the governor's state the other day that she was now trying to uh, create uh, through the state. Uh, and, and these are reports that the hospitals and other entities report to the state. Greater degree of information about those people that are hospitalized, those that are, suffer fatalities, so that we can, we can understand you know, more what happens. Uh, it has been generally asserted that the majority of people who are hospitalized are unvaccinated. I don't have numbers that, that point to that or prove that. We hope to see those numbers from the state. And if, those, uh, if that assertion holds up, or if it doesn't hold up, we will be transparent and share that with you. Now, keep in mind, we're sharing Westchester numbers. These are numbers that are attributed to Westchester County. I say this all the time. We are not an island. What's happening in Putnam County, Dutchess County, Rockland, Orange, in the Bronx, in Connecticut, northern New Jersey, the rest of the city, has an impact on us. Many of us wake up in Westchester and spend the day working in those other locations. I've worked in Stanford, Connecticut. I've worked in Basking Ridge, New Jersey. I've worked in locations in Manhattan and the Bronx, as well as various locations here in Westchester County. And I worked alongside people that came from other jurisdictions. So um, we are not living on an island, and if something is communicable, and I am going to what I did for three years, an office in Stanford, Connecticut, and the person I'm sitting next to is from Norwalk or lives in Norwalk, Connecticut, there's that interaction. And people who work in Westchester uh, reside in other locations. So just to look at Westchester's numbers alone is not sufficient to be able to see what the scope of concern is about all of this. But a tenfold increase in, uh, in expansion of infection has been followed by, in very round numbers, a five-fold, a less than five-fold increase in hospitalizations. The really bad news is that of fatalities. In the month of November, the calendar month, November 1st, November 30th, we lost seven people to COVID, seven deaths in the month of November. In the month of December, we lost 60. That's a nine-fold increase, almost a nine-fold increase in fatalities from seven to 60. 60 fatalities in a month <coughs> does not equal the horror that we experienced in the spring of 2020. We had, in the spring of 2020, one night where we lost 70 civilians in one night to COVID, and the day before and the day after, we lost 30 to 40. We had to rent refrigerator trucks, something I never imagined I would ever be responsible for doing as a county executive. We had to rent refrigerator trucks because the civilian system of funeral parlors and uh, grave sites and places where bodies are cremated could not handle the amount of fatalities that we had. That was at its absolute worst of the pandemic. However, going from seven fatalities to 30 fatalities, which is a fourfold jump, is serious. Now, you may remember about three and a half weeks ago, almost four weeks ago, I issued a declaration of emergency. That declaration is still in effect. When I issued the declaration, I did not attach to it any particular mandate from the county government. But what I did say is that we were very serious about warning everybody that this was on the rise. So we foresaw the rise in these things. And we've gone out to be very aggressive in our vaccination strategies. We've tried to respond as fast as we can on the testing strategies. Uh, the test uh, kits have not been available in sufficient quantity from the federal government through the state government to us. As soon as we, the county government, receives test kits, we have disseminated them immediately. We've disseminated them to federally qualified health centers like Open Door, Greenberg Health Center, Mount Vernon Health Center, Hudson River Health Centers to satisfy the need of the indigent population that can't pay for tests under any circumstances. We've also made sure that we got them out to the various uh, first responders, uh, EMS individuals, police and fire, because those individuals are essential functioning in the society. We've got to know if they're positive or not. And if they're positive and they have to go off doing the work they have to do, we've got to make sure we have enough people to cover police, fire, and EMS services. So targeting kits for that particular portion of the workforce was essential. And then, something to the tune of about 35,000 test kits two weeks ago, we disseminated them through the different municipalities. A couple of days before Christmas, we sent county officials to the state to pick up the test kits. We had them available at our emergency services headquarters in Valhalla, and the various municipalities then, we called them, and they came out to us and picked up a certain allocation, which they then gave out as they saw fit within their different communities. Every community had an insufficient amount to manage demand. But the, the, the demand 
excess oversupply is not a Westchester issue. And I'm sure you know this. If you turn on the nightly news from for the region, you'll see the same issues in northern New Jersey, Long Island, and Connecticut, long lines, people waiting at the urgent care center, people waiting in the hospital in order to get testing. And if you watch the national news, the same thing is happening in Georgia, in North Carolina, in the West Coast, and elsewhere. So we have been trying to obtain as much test kits as we can. We've tried to obtain as much PCR testing as we can and make them as quickly available. You don't hoard them, but make sure they get out to folks uh, to deal with this. But the demand for testing has skyrocketed. Part of it was seasonal because this is the time of the year where people travel to be with family and friends. And, you know, you may not get on an airplane until you have a negative test or, uh, you know, grandma and grandpa may want you to have a negative test before that you come to see them. I happen to be grandpa now, so I can understand that motivation. Um, but there are a lot of seasonal reasons why there was demand. And the widespread nature of the disease is such that everybody is now jumping. If you know this person has it and that person has it, uh, and you're exposed to those people, then you feel you may have it and you want to be tested. And it's not that the test gives you permanent protection against getting it in the future. The test is almost a photograph of where you are today. Take a picture today. I've been working at trying to lose weight. I get on the scale today. That's today's weight. That's not necessarily tomorrow's weight if I lose focus and overeat today. Um, and, and all it tells you is where are you today. And many times in the protocol of the disease, people will say, well, wait a couple of days if you've been exposed because it may not manifest in your system right away. Well, what do you do in those couple of days? Well, you know, science says you're supposed to quarantine, voluntarily quarantine. You don't have the disease. It doesn't show up in a test, but you might have it, and it might develop in three days. Take your test in two or three days. And for some people, uh, depending on what you do for a living and what your responsibilities are, that may not be a practical advice. If you work in an hourly wage situation, you're not paid when you don't show up at work. And so your attitude is, listen, I'm going to go to work, and if I start getting symptomatic, if I start having you know, trouble breathing or the fever or whatever, then I'll jump out. By then, you may have infected a number of people. And that is when you have symptoms. If you don't have symptoms, you don't know that you have it. And the person that you might give it to you know, might resent you for it, but there's no way for you to have uh, presumed that. Otherwise, every single person would test every single day, and that's not, that is not a realistic expectation. So the tools that we have uh, to deal with this outbreak, this is now serious, and the emergency uh, declaration gives us some authority, and as we watch these numbers rise, we'll watch them very carefully. I resist, and I, we have this debate, and people, you know, write me on Facebook, how come you don't do what New York City's doing, or I heard that somebody's doing this in Colorado, and you ought to do this too. The society is divided. You know this. I'm not telling you anything that's front page news. The society is deeply divided on this and many other issues. And when the, when the need and the danger is so clear that only a handful of people really fail to accept the sacrifice that's necessary, then we take the stronger action. If we take the stronger action preemptively, then we create a chaos that, that doesn't help us fight the disease. So we've made the decision that, that uh, the governor made a mask mandate. We will implement that mandate. Enforce is a different thing. We don't, we don't enforce. Enforcement is the last stop on the train. That's when somebody willfully doesn't want to do something. They defy the authority uh, to make them do something. You write them a ticket or you create some sanction. The enforcement activity that matters in the front end is implementation, is making it possible for people to comply. And we've done that by dis uh, disseminating masks all across this county. We've done it through various chambers of commerce, various houses of worship. Uh, I happen to be Roman Catholic. When I've gone to church over the course of these last two weeks, I walk in. Um, you know, the cardinal has established a policy. Everyone's wearing a mask. I don't see people coming in arguing with the priest that, uh, well, the cardinal, what's he to tell me what to do? And, um, and I've walked into restaurants uh, where the mask uh, is enforced. I've walked into major shopping stores, some smaller ones. Um, and this is not about, I want to have power over you. I don't personally like wearing the mask. I carry it with me, and I wear it because I have to. But why would I wear the mask? Because if I'm in close proximity to Catherine Borgia or Nancy Barr or um, um, uh, Melanie Montalto or some other people who I'm seeing just for a few minutes, if I have this disease again, I might convey it to them. 
when I put the mask on, it reduces the likelihood of it. It doesn't make it impossible to happen because this is highly contagious, but it reduces the probability. When you get in a car, you raise the probability of an accident if you're sleeping. You raise the probability of the accident if you're on the cell phone. You raise the probability of the accident if you're uh, imbibing alcohol. You don't drink, you don't text, you, um, you, you don't play around with the radio uh, unnecessarily in order to keep your focus on the road. You're making it less likely that you can have an accident. That's prudent thinking. That's what you should do. And we've all broken those rules. We've all played with the radio when we shouldn't have. We've all you know, looked at the text thing when we shouldn't have. Uh, even when you have a Bluetooth on the phone, you're talking on the phone, you know, I'm telling you, you know, you're in the road. And it's human nature. But the question is, will we rise above human nature to deal with a pandemic that has now reached 444 people hospitalized? That's not a question that's decided by a legislature or by an executive. That's decided by each of us. And when we say, I'm a free American, I can make a free decision, you are. You're free to decide to drink at the wheel. But if you drink and you get behind the wheel, you've broken a law and the sanction is serious. It's a serious sanction because you've used your free will in a way that was selfish, not in a way that took other people's consideration in mind. And hopefully, if you do get caught drinking at the wheel, it isn't at a crash scene where somebody else has died. Somebody else who was not guilty of breaking, not just the law, but breaking common sense. How do I explain that? How do I, how do I get that point across to people? It's not a political statement. This is a matter of protecting somebody else. People say, masks don't work. What do you expect that they do? Do you expect that they eliminate the conveyance of the disease? No, it doesn't happen that way, but it reduces it. And if you reduce it, you have less people infected. You have a lot already. That number could be higher if we all decided to walk around without masks. Be a higher number, higher number of people hospitalized, quite possibly a higher number of people fatality. That to me is common sense. I come out of a corporate background, so does Ken. I know you don't realize that because you only see us as people in public office for all these years. But in my, in my corporate career, I was tasked as a young man with accomplishing a certain goal. And they didn't care what my ideology was. What mattered was that I accomplished those goals. I had certain targets to reach in terms of revenue generated, in terms of uh, reaching the target market for the entities that I was responsible for. Ken had a different kind of private sector experience, but he had goals and timetables. And you didn't argue over philosophy, you accomplished the mission at hand. The mission at hand is to have one of these updates and not talk about COVID ever to throw this away and let's talk about the legislation that the Board of Legislators is working on. Let's talk about the capital projects we're doing. Let's talk about the new affordable housing units that are coming online. Let's talk about the bridges and roads that we've been able to repair. Let's talk about the upgrades to the sewer treatment plan so you don't have any problems when you flush the toilet at home. The county is doing its job. That's what the county government is tasked with doing. COVID came upon all of us slightly less than two years ago. And so now we respond to it. So I give you the bad news that the numbers are bad. There's an explosion of active cases. Let me give you some additional news. Free PCR testing is available at Westchester County Center in White Plains, but it is available only for symptomatic persons or those that have known exposure. Why would we do this? Because we have a limited number of tests. We go through the tests in a shot. This is testing is not for travel. This is testing by appointment only. As much as you might want to be tested for your reasons, if you are symptomatic, then we're specifically concerned that you don't have a cold, you don't have the flu, you have COVID. And you want to, we want to make sure those people get tested. And you want to make sure that if you've had a known exposure, you've had clear, close contact with somebody, your spouse, somebody <coughs> that has COVID, then it's important for you to be able to do that. On social media, we will post the information where you can sign up for testing. Um, I don't know if we have this scroll on our, uh, on our uh, screen right now, but it's certainly available on our website. There's new tests available for scheduling every day on the website, but we all understand something. The demand for testing exceeds the supply. And once the supply is exhausted for a given day, there are no more appointments. And this is frustrating. And I, I understand it's frustrating, but we have to work through what we have. If we have 250 available, that's how many we have. If you're the 251st person, 
then we can't accommodate that. If we were given unlimited test kits from, from the federal government, if that were possible, if they were working 24-7 around the clock in every factory like we did during World War II, producing test kits, and we had this available, we'd run the county center 24 hours a day. As it was, we ran it from 8 a.m. to 11, something like that, when we were going cracking. We would be glad to run it around the clock, and the people who worked there would be glad to get the overtime. Mm -hmm. So it's not a question of a willingness to do it. It's the amount of testing that we have available. That's what's limited. But the county center is a source for that. Testing has now been made available by the state of New York at Grace Baptist Church in Mount Vernon at 52 South 6th Avenue. That's between 1st Street and 2nd Street in the city of Mount Vernon. Um, the site provides rapid tests, and they may yet provide PCR tests at a later time and date. Uh, if you're in need of a test, you can also consult the New York State COVID-19 Test Finder site. Um, there is a, uh, a link which we'll post on social media. It's coronavirus.health.ny.gov backslash find test. It's uh, kind of long and drawn out, but look at that, and that is another tool to look at. Those of a need of a test can also call the New York State COVID-19 hotline at 888-364-3065. Those in need of a test can also make appointments at the Westchester Medical Center COVID-19 testing site in Valhalla. That's at the campus of Westchester Medical Center. 914-202-4530. Governor Hochul has just announced that testing would be available at SUNY Purchase upcoming. That's not yet online. The specifics haven't been identified yet, but we expect them to be coming out uh, a little bit shortly. I'm going to uh, deviate from uh, the schedule that I had here and jump ahead to satellite sites and then come back to do other things. Right now we're talking about places where you can go to be tested. But we are still very much as a county government involved in vaccinating. And those vaccinations include uh, pediatric vaccinations, first and second doses. And um, we have our health department and, and others working double time to try to accommodate this. They've done a, a terrific job all throughout the holiday season and again uh, this week as well. So Ken will update us on the various vaccination satellite sites. Ken Jenkins. Thanks, George. And, and uh, again, uh, to, uh, to echo one of the things that the county executive is saying, especially about testing, um, that to go through that process, um, that once you get to the place, you could test too soon. And we said that early in the pandemic, and that's still a, a situation now that you understand that you've been a close contact, potentially a close contact. You have to wait a, a period of time, and that period of time, if you can, um, and isolate or, or you know, go into preventive quarantine measures, uh, a lot of people are able to do that. I think you just got to make sure to um, act accordingly through this particular process. As far as the vaccine satellite sites, we are, they are going to continue. And uh, again, we have great partnership with the, the vendors that have been doing this, as well as our volunteer ambulance call um, in Ossining, um, the chairwoman's hometown. So we want to give the Ossining Volunteer Ambulance Corps a, a shout out, as well as the Scarsdale Volunteer Ambulance Corps that have been providing a lot of work for us at these satellite sites. Today, we have two that are happening. One that is happening from the Croton um, and Austin Volunteer Ambulance Corps again in Croton at the Carrie Tompkins Elementary School. And that is for the first dose. And today also at the Columbus School in New Rochelle. Again, we've been targeting to get to those um, those folks that are five to 12 years old in, in the schools to try to make sure that they get protected in uh, working through this particular process. Um, tomorrow, we're being in Port Chester. That's for the second dose at the uh, Port Chester Middle School. Um, Thursday will be in Chappaqua um, for second doses again. And on Friday, we're going to be at the Eugenio Maria de Hostos Micro Society School. That's in Yonkers for their second doses. And then Saturday, we'll be in Peekskill for our second doses as well. New York State is providing an additional vaccination site at the Grinton Will Library on Central Avenue in Yonkers. Two days on the 8th, on Saturday the 8th from 11 to 5, and then again on the 29th 
again, at the Will Library on Central um, Park Avenue. These vaccination uh, satellites are extremely important, and it's important to consider why um, the county executive has been very strong about not calling them anything else but satellite locations. They're not fly-by-night um, organizations that are doing this. They are professionals at an outreach location to try to get as many people vaccinated as possible. Um, both the county executive and I are firm believers that our symptoms through the process of um, contracting COVID were extremely mild because of the vaccinations. So do everything that you can um, and be vaccinated and boosted when you're eligible. Five months now for Pfizer, six months for Moderna. And if you had the Johnson & Johnson, you have um, the ability after two months to do that. So please, please, please get vaccinated. Look at the, the website of westchestergov.com. The health department website has these particular locations up and we'll keep going and con continue to thank all of our partners that have worked so hard with us through this vaccination satellite organizations. Thanks, George. Ken, you can have a seat too. There's no reason okay. for you to. <laughs> Um, as, as we're mentioning also, it's important to understand a little bit about uh, the COVID-19 home tests. This just reviews certain information that we assume you know. Uh, if you get the test and you read it and you read the box that it comes in, it'll give you some information. But these home tests or the over-the-counter tests are a measure that you can use to protect yourself. Uh, these tests can help quickly let you know if you have COVID. It's important that you read the manufacturer's instructions on the packet information. Uh, there's some differences between different types of tests. Be sure you read before you go ahead and start to use the product. A positive test result means that the test has detected the virus and you should stay home and isolate others for 10 days. Now, when you're testing yourself, you're not in a room with other people being made aware of this necessarily. So you have to know that a positive test is an issue that you now have to deal with and you have to take the steps necessary to go forward. Notify your employer, notify the school, any close contacts you've had, house, household members, relatives, or friends. Since home tests are not reportable to the health department at this time, they're not required to be reported, the contact tracing system, which has been stressed to the max right now, doesn't apply. So you have to know, and of the people that you've had contact with, when I was uh, uh, told a couple of weeks ago on a Monday that I had this, I had a contact tracer call me and I went through my extensive schedule of all the different places I was. That doesn't happen with a home test. You have to know not only that you have to isolate, but also who you've been in contact with, and you need to inform them so that they too can uh, have a test. If you Once you've been tested and you know. A person with COVID-19 can begin spreading it starting two days before having any symptoms. Now, that's, that's a difficult thing to deal with because how do you know what you have until you feel something is, uh, is awry? And at this stage of the game, uh, the, uh, the specimen is collected after two days, uh, and then that gives the, the, the most accurate test. A negative self-test result means that the test did not detect the virus and you may not have an effect, infection. However, a negative test result does not rule out infection. There is a requires usually a second test, 24 hours home test, after the first test, if the first test is negative to ensure the most accurate results you test, and you test 24 hours later. That means you have to have two of those tests to be able to do this. That's usually why test kits are sold in packages of two if you've noticed or given out in packages of two. Um, if you uh, have a, a self-test that comes up negative, you may still want to try to obtain a, uh, um, a test to go further, PCR test, molecular test, to know whether or not uh, you have the disease because it is possible that the degree of accuracy of the home tests are less accurate than the PCR tests that are done uh, through the laboratories. And this is all down to available testing, time, and what your lifestyle and your circumstances are. Uh, very different topic on the COVID area. If you need food um, while you're in isolation for COVID, there is a number to call here uh, in the county government, 995-5566. Now that's a weekday number, Monday through Friday, nine to five. If you are in need of uh, assistance with securing food, 
995-5566. It's available to anyone, regardless of income level, but it is a Monday through Friday situation. Uh, there are a lot of um, uh, food distribution areas that go out into the community, but if you have COVID, you're not supposed to go out in the community, and you obviously need to have uh, nutrition and, and sustenance. I also want to mention that uh, the FDA has amended the emergency youth authorization for the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine. The CDC has still yet to weigh in and issue final clinical recommendations, meaning that these recommendations are not yet final, but some of the initial changes that the CDC has authorized. Eligibility for boosters is now recommended for those ages 12 through 15. The time between the second dose and a booster shot is shortened to five months between the second shot and the booster shot. A third primary series dose was authorized for certain immunocompromised children ages 5 to 11 to be administered four weeks after the second dose. You have to fall into this category. If you're, you know, have a child age 5 to 11, they're immunocompromised. That means they have a, a, a more um, weakened immune system. And uh, that, therefore, a second dose is authorized. And uh, it's identified at this point that children ages 5 to 11 who are not immunocompromised do not need a third dose at this time, but the FDA continues to monitor the situation. All of this information is coming out in real time. You, like we, are seeing, uh, you know, something come out from the CDC, but uh, until the New York State Department of Health reviews it and approves it as a policy, the county health department can't implement it. So we've had situations with the school district, CDC says something, uh, why aren't we following that? We aren't following it because New York State DOH, uh, Department of Health, has not yet authorized us. And the county health department uh, is responsible to implement that which the state health department authorizes. And we can't go off on our own unless we've been given the authority to do something. And in some specific cases, we have been high-risk sports. Back in the winter of last year, we were authorized to make the decisions locally. More often than not, the state wants to make the decision and make it uniform across the state. So uh, that's a few more bits of information. I have exhausted for the moment uh, the news that relates to COVID. So I want to go back to the good news to close out before we have any, um, before we have any uh, questions from the press. Um, we do have some fun in the society. It's hard to imagine that we do. We just completed Winter Wonderland over the weekend, and you may recall that that started right after Thanksgiving. Ken was uh, opening on it. It was a drive-through, uh, lovely holiday uh, experience. So now the next thing to put on your agenda for basketball fans is Iona College is hosting the Slam Dunk Showcase for 2022. This is on Sunday, January 9th. That's this coming Sunday at Iona College's Heinz Athletic Center in New Rochelle. Ken is a graduate of Iona College. I am a parent of an Iona College graduate. I jokingly said that I would go to McSpedden Hall with the tuition checks. That was my connection to Iona College. But uh, Iona College is hosting this, and Heinz is a beautiful facility. Uh, there will be 12 teams, three, uh, three competitions, two teams each, three games of girl, uh, uh, high school players, three games with boy high school players. Uh, a couple of them are Westchester schools. A couple of them come from outside of Westchester. Just so you know the lineup, Putnam Valley plays Walter Pattis at 10:15 on that Sunday morning. Harrison girls play Alberta Magnus girls at 12 noon. We flip over to the boys at 145 Middletown versus Mount Vernon High School. And then Walter Pattis boys play White Plains High School boys at 3.30. We go back to the girls at 515 Ursuline and Mayapak, and then it closes out at 7 o'clock at Nye Briarcliff versus Hastings. These are going to be competitive high school matchups, uh, all wonderful programs. It's a $5 admission. How could you go wrong? Tickets can be purchased at the door the day of the event. Parking is free. This is presented by Westchester County Parks Department, and, and some of the young players that are going to be playing in this game will wind up in Division I schools, and any number of them might wind up playing professional basketball. We've had any number of Westchester residents over the last 50 years uh, make it to the NBA, and were highlighted in some of these different types of uh, showcase events. Now, it's a slam dunk showcase. They're not, they're not having a slam dunk competition, but you'll see some slam dunks, you know, life above the game, above the rim. And uh, also, because Iona College <coughs> is the home 
of our NCAA qualifying teams. And we now have the great Rick Pitino coaching the Iona team. He has taken Louisville, Kentucky, and Providence to the NCAAs in his uh, athletic career. Coached the Knicks a while back as well, very successfully. Uh, we're very happy to have Rick Pitino in the Westchester community. And uh, it, it's changed sort of the focus of the Iona program. Ken Jenkins is extremely proud of this. And um, it, is, uh, it will be a great place to watch it. Now, keep in mind that you have to provide proof of vaccination to get in or a qualifying uh, negative test, PCR antigen test, to gain entry into the Heinz Center. Do not come without your vaccination card or without uh, proof of negative testing. Um, all spectators are expected to wear masks at all times in the Heinz Center, regardless of your vaccination status. You can get more information by going to our website, events.westchestergov.com. It's all there for you. You can call the Parks Department at 231-4500 this Sunday, January 9th at Iona College. Um, some uh, outstanding basketball, six outstanding basketball games starts at, in the morning, 10, 10, 15 in the morning until 7 o'clock. The last game starts. And if you like basketball, this is the place to come and enjoy it. Again, a function of Westchester County's uh, Parks and Recreation Program. Have some active recreation, something you can look forward to. I'm going to turn to Catherine Chaffee, our Director of Communications, for any questions that we may have. Yes, we have Catherine. a few. So the first question comes from David Proper from the Journal News. He asks, how many tests are available at the county center daily? And how did the county link up with Quadrant Bioscience? Well, uh, we had um, reached out to Quadrant. They had expressed an interest in uh, partnering uh, for this. And so we had that discussion, and that's what led to uh, Quadrant's willingness to set up in the county center. We knew we had an asset, a physical asset in the county center that had been used for vaccinations for an extended period of time. And, uh, but we did not have the ability to uh, provide the test nor the, uh, nor the sufficient medical professionals to do it. So Quadrant was our partner, discussion and, and negotiating and came to closure on that. I believe we have 250 tests uh, available a day. I believe that's the number. Uh, I'm not exactly sure if that is that correct. Okay, 250 is the number per day. Goes pretty fast. Uh, but, and, and obviously that number will rise if we have more access uh, to more testing. The next question comes from David Wolf from News 12. Is the mandate uh, for indoor mask requirements that the governor imposed having an impact in Westchester when it comes to slowing the spread of the virus? Well, I think, uh, David, the numbers that we show in Westchester as percentages are not as severe as you're seeing in some other areas around us. Everyone is experiencing a big jump in numbers, so there's no one that's, uh, um, you know, uh, separated from it. The, the, the real comparison isn't between parts of New York with each other parts of New York. It's between New York and other states. And I think you're still seeing a lot of southern states that have no mask, no vaccination requirements of any sort. You know, it's, um, you know, it's a different philosophy in dealing with this pandemic. Uh, and I think when I read about where uh, the system is stressed, uh, our healthcare system is not stressed to the maximum here in New York, certainly not in Westchester County, um, some of the rural areas more so because of the lack of available hospitals and hospital beds. But I think we compare favorably to play other places. Now keep in mind, when you compare New York in the wintertime to Florida in the wintertime, Florida is a warm weather state. Much more of their activities are outdoors, so they're not put into an indoor setting as you are in the Northeast or in the Midwest or in the Rocky Mountain states. Uh, and the population density here is much greater than it is in any of those southern states. As many people, as many more people as live in Texas and Florida than in New York, they are spread out over a larger geographic area, so they're not as densely populated in as large a part of the state, their states, as we are. So those are factors that mitigate. But I think our numbers compare favorably and I think it's, uh, it's demonstrable to me that the wearing of the mask helps keep down the numbers. The numbers are rising. They would rise by more if we didn't have masking as part of the process. And the last question comes from Pete Ruff, also from News 12. He asks, why is it important to hold the slam dunk tournament after canceling it last year? How has Iona College played a role in making it happen? Well, I want to compliment Iona College. Uh, and I, as I just said, uh, they put in certain protocols not required necessarily by law, but the vaccination proof, the, uh, the masking requirements uh, represent their understanding of the moment that we're in. And so for basketball fans who want to come and enjoy basketball, there's a way for them to do this. And, and the, the, the basic news is that we can have uh, approaching normalcy if we're prepared to understand there's certain sacrifices to make. Um, 
the, the concept of shutting everything down permanently is not a viable one. Uh, the economic impact, the, the sociological impact, the mental health impact would be dramatic of trying to sort of starve out the virus by just sh shutting everything down. It was done for a period of time when the pandemic first started, but we didn't have the tool of vaccination at that standpoint. Uh, and there were other tools that have become more available to us. We now have uh, infusion therapy that can help those who contract the disease. If it's administered at a certain time, now Pfizer's working on a, a pill, maybe it's uh, been approved. Uh, so there's some tools that we have in the toolkit now that allow us to uh, have something like this happen uh, outdoors. And I think it's important to show in the same way that a year ago, even during the heart of the pandemic, we kept our parks open. We kept the golf courses open. Now in the heart of the winter, they weren't open, but in the, uh, you know, in, in the seasonal shoulder of the spring, they were open. And we made it a point of uh, keeping as much uh, passive recreation throughout the winter open as we could so that there was an attempt to try to give people a chance to socially distance and still maintain some normalcy. We reinstituted both uh, years of the pandemic uh, the, um, the Bicycle Sunday program and we expanded it through generosity, I might add, over the course of the full summer in both of those two years, more dates than we've had in any past year. Uh, and that comes from the same mindset of trying to make certain things available so that people can enjoy it. The reconfiguration of Winter Wonderland is an example of that. It was park the car, get out with the kids, walk around and enjoy Winter Wonderland. That has been repurposed the last two years to a drive-through scenario, uh, which has, is different, but it also provides entertainment. And uh, we think that uh, the slam dunk tournament happening this year is a good sign. As I said yesterday when I spoke in my inauguration, I'll let this be the close out of this, uh, I'm still optimistic about where we can be in 2022. I'm optimistic because we have tools today that we did not have a year ago today. The, the debate in the society is using those tools, is that we have different philosophies at work that uh, argue that, no, well, you shouldn't do this, and no, you shouldn't do that, or you have reasons not to do this and that. And, you know, I, I'm not here to argue a person's philosophy. You have a philosophy, that's your philosophy. But the, the success of the society in getting past this disease is going to be in direct correlation to how much we use the tools and we show, you've heard this from me about a hundred times, thoughtfulness, self-discipline, and perseverance. And, um, you know, you can reject that if you want. That's your option. But I don't see any other way we get out of this. There is no magic bullet. I, I don't believe that hydroxychloroquine gets us out of this. I don't believe that uh, ivermectin gets us out of this. I think it does a good job of deworming cattle, but I don't think it does a very good job of dealing with, uh, you know, with this virus. And uh, while I'm not a scientist, I argue with people who are insistent that they have some other way, or we can just wish it away. We can forget about it. We can do what some of the southern states are doing. Don't do anything. Um, we'll see. We'll see how it all turns out. But I do think we get through this. And whether it's a basketball tournament today or high school graduations in the spring, I want us to get back to normalcy. I want us not to have masks. I want us to have a, a life that uh, is the life that we had prior to March 3rd, uh, 2020. But we don't get there by wishing it so. We get there by hard work, discipline, and I think we get there. So with that, I thank you for watching. Again, congratulations to the Board of Legislators, their new leadership, Catherine Borges Chair, and uh, Nancy Barr Vice Chair, and the new Majority and Minority Leaders. Uh, we wish them great luck, Godspeed, and we hope that uh, when we're here with you on Monday of next week, somehow the numbers look better, and we can give you a little more optimistic view. But in the meantime, be smart, stay safe, and uh, we'll see you uh, next Monday.